Lecture 37. The Rapture of the Saints. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 58. Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Verses 51 to 58. With these words, the Apostle Paul brings to a close his great treatise on the resurrection, first dealing with that of Christ and then with that of the saints. In this particular section he shows us that while all will have part in the glorious event at the resurrection of the saints, yet some will not pass through death, but will be changed instead of being raised. We noticed in the closing verses of the previous portion the statement that, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God refers, of course, to that future reign when the authority of God will be manifested in heaven and over all the earth. The kingdom of God will consist of two spheres. Our Lord Jesus says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, Matt 13.43. Those are the heavenly saints in the kingdom day. Then we also read of people brought into this blessing here on earth during the kingdom. They, of course, will be in bodies of flesh and blood. The apostle is here considering the heavenly side of the kingdom when he says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. As we have remarked before, those that are accounted worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven because they are the children of the resurrection. That will be the heavenly aspect of the kingdom. Observe, the apostle does not say, neither flesh, nor blood, but says, flesh, and blood. That is, our bodies in their present condition as sustained by blood are not suited for heaven, for the coming glorious kingdom, and therefore we must be changed. How will this change take place? Behold, I show you a mystery. We have often pointed out that a mystery in the New Testament is not something mysterious and difficult to understand. The Greek word is almost anglicized here, and does not mean something strange and hard to comprehend, but a mystery is something revealed only to the initiated. Some of you have been initiated into some secret society, and have not discovered anything very mysterious, but you have found that there are certain things on the inside that folk like myself on the outside do not know anything about. That is the real use of the word here. It is a secret not known to the generality of the people, but made known to the initiated, and all God's beloved people are looked upon by him as his initiated ones. The only lodge I have ever joined is the Grand Army of the Redeemed. I was initiated into that by being born again, and then the Holy Spirit conducted me from chair to chair and revealed the mysteries as you have them here in the Word of God. There are a number of these sacred secrets which were kept from the people of God in past dispensations, but are made known now in the glorious dispensation of the Holy Spirit. One of them is this mystery of the first resurrection and the rapture of the living saints. Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is a very remarkable statement. We often hear it said that, that, there is nothing more certain than death and taxes. Taxes seem to be quite certain, but I am glad to say that death is not absolutely certain for the Christian. Well, someone says, doesn't the word say, it is appointed unto man once to die? That is the divine appointment for man as such, but there will be a generation of God's redeemed people who will be exempt from that. We shall not all sleep. He uses the word sleep in place of die, for death to the believer is the putting of the tired, weary, worn body to sleep until the Lord Jesus comes to waken it again. It is only the body that sleeps. The real man, the spirit and soul, is absent from the body and present with the Lord, taken home to be with Christ, which is far better, so that the bodies of our friends in Christ who have died are sleeping, but they themselves are with Christ, 
wonderfully happy in his presence. The Apostle Paul gives us an idea of their state and condition when he speaks of being caught up to the third heaven. That is the immediate dwelling place of God. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven, the second is the stellar or the starry heaven, and the third is God's dwelling place. The Apostle had the experience of being caught up into the third heaven, and he was so enraptured that he could not tell whether he was in the body or out of the body. That teaches us several things. First, if Paul was in the body, his body was no clog upon him, and when we are in the presence of the Lord in the body our bodies will be no hindrance to us as they often are now. But if Paul was taken out of the bo body, then he did not miss his body. He was just as conscious out of as he could be in it. Some say that it is impossible to live out of the body, but it is no more impossible than it is for the works of a watch to go on running without the case. The body dies, it is put to sleep, but the believer lives on, absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. In the first resurrection, the body is raised in glory, and the Spirit comes to dwell in the body again. That is the state of the believer when Christ calls us forth from the tomb. How many have questioned these words, we shall not all sleep? It is a remarkable fact that in the Douay version, which is read by a large section of the professed Church of Christ, this passage reads, we shall all rise again, but we shall not all be changed. How it ever got into the text perplexes people, but that is exactly what is written in the Vatican manuscript. But older ones read like the translation we have here, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The manuscript of the 4th century, from which the Douay version was translated, shows how unbelievers had already come in, some scribe tampered with the text, and if it were not that we have older manus manuscripts giving it as here we might be perplexed about it. But we shall not all sleep, and there may be some of us in this generation who will be living when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. But whether living or dead we shall all be changed. Every one of us must undergo the glorious change in order to have part in the heavenly side of the kingdom, and that shall take place instantly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I cannot think of anything much faster than that. It does not say, in the winking of an eye, but in the twinkling of an eye. As quickly as a gleam of light shines in the eye, so quickly shall we be changed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have often tried to think of what that would mean. There are dear children of God lying on hospital beds, weak and suffering, enduring days of pain and nights of anguish, and they are crying in the distress of their souls, O oh Lord, how long? One moment enduring excruciating pain, and the next rising to meet the Lord in the air in a body that can never suffer again. Then there are some of God's people whose minds have failed because of the stress of things, perhaps shut away in some sanitarium, possibly melancholy and in gloom, gloom, maybe imagining that God has forsaken them and that there is no hope for them. The poor brain has given way completely, and yet the next moment with intelligence such as the angels have, as they find themselves in their glorified bodies looking into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a marvelous hope it is! No wonder the Apostle calls it this blessed hope. We shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When will that be? At the last trump. How may we understand that? There are those who have attempted to link this trump with the trumpet of the seventh angel in Revelation. In that book you have a series of seven trumpets, and when they are blown, various judgments are poured out upon the earth, and when the seventh is blown, the kingdom of God is ushered in. Some have thought the apostle is referring to that trumpet, thus indicating that the church of God would be here on earth going through all the tribulation and distress, only to be saved out of it when the seventh trumpet is blown. But the book of Revelation was not written until approximately thirty years after the writing of this epistle, so that there is no possible way by which there could be a connection between these, these trumpets. And when we turn to 1 Thessalonians we find that this trumpet is called, the trump of God, 416. It is not the trumpet of an angel. Why is the trump of God here called the last trump? That expression was very familiar to the people who lived in Paul's day. It was in common use in connection with the Roman army. When a Roman camp was about to be broken up, whether in the middle of the night or in the day, a trumpet was sounded. The first blast meant, strike tents and prepare to depart. The second meant, fall into line, and when what was called the last trump sounded it meant, march away. The apostle uses that figure and says that when the last trump of this age of grace sounds, 
then we shall be called away to be forever with the Lord. We have heard the first. Many of you remember when you were just part and parcel of the world, you were living with the world and like the world, and you were settling down here, but you heard the gospel trumpet awakening you out of your sleep. And then I trust you have heard the second trumpet calling you to take your places in fellowship with God's beloved people as soldiers in this scene. And now what wait we for? For, for the last trump, when we shall be summoned, not to march away nor yet to fly away, but when we shall be caught up together, to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. When will it take place? It is an undated event in the ways of God with men. It may take place today, it may be tonight, but whether at midnight or in the morning or in the daytime it will make no difference to us for we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. I do not need to dwell on that. And we, who are living, shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You will notice that you have the two groups. This corruptible, that refers to the dead, must put on incorruption. The dead whose bodies have corrupted away will be raised in incorruptible bodies. But the living, this mortal, those that are alive, but subject to death if time goes on, shall put on immortality. This is the promise that we have in Romans 8 verse 10, where we read, If Christ be in you, the body is dead. A little word is omitted there which may be added to make it more clear. The body is still, dead because of sin. You may be a believer, but your body is still under the Adamic sentence, dying thou shalt die. But the spirit is alive and is the pledge of the new life yet to be. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you, Romans 8 verse 11. I know that some have taught that the indwelling spirit gives new life to the mortal body right here and now. But that is what the Apostle denies in the 10th verse, if Christ be in you, the body is, still, dead because of sin. But if the Spirit, the Spirit of life, dwells in you, someday he shall quicken into newness of life your mortal body by the Spirit that dwelleth within you. When will that be? At the coming of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Then we read, this mortal must put on immortality. Notice the terms. Mortal and immortal. These refer to the body, never to the spirit or soul. The everlasting existence of man is taught in scripture, but immortality is a blessing that will be revealed when our Lord comes. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And now he goes back and quotes from the book of the prophet Hosea, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death! Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1314. Death comes in and takes from us our nearest and nearest and dearest, and our hearts are pained because of the separation. But if we know Christ, and if our loved ones were in Christ, the sting of death is gone, and we are looking on to a glorious reunion when Jesus comes again. What a wonderful event it will be when saints who have been separated here on earth will recognize one another as we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Then we can sing, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That which makes death terrible to the unsaved is sin, the sting of death is sin, but if we know that sin has been put away, that sin has been purged by the precious atoning blood of Christ, then that sting of death is gone. The strength of sin is the law. Do you believe that? I wonder whether some of you have not thought that the law is the strength of holiness. You have imagined that the way to be holy was to be under the law, and you have tried to obtain sanctification by keeping the law. It says here, the strength of sin is the law, not, the strength of holiness is the law. What does he mean? The law simply stirs up everything in the human heart that is opposed to God, and instead of producing holiness the result is greater transgression. That is what the Apostle puts before the Galatians and the Romans. The law never produces holiness. It is the heart occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ that produces holiness. When you have seen that the law condemns, but that Christ has borne the condemnation for you, then you can look away to him, and as you are occupied with him you will be a holy man or woman. You cannot make yourself holy by rules and regulations. 
Not even God's law given at Sinai has the ability to make men holy, but the living glorified Christ can change people into his image as they are taken up with him, so that they become holy. Paul concludes this section by saying, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death may seem for the moment to triumph. It looked like triumph when death came into your home. I felt it was a triumph of death when it came years ago into our home and took one after another whom I loved most tenderly, but as I look on to the glorious future and realize that death is to be swallowed up in victory at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I can already claim by faith that conquest over it and exclaim, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the verse with which the section closes comes home to every one of us, therefore, because these things are true, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. They tell me that occupation with these precious truths that have to do with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may have a tendency to make people heady and theoretical, and no longer useful in the church of God here on earth, but I do not know anything that should so grip the soul and put one to work for God as the knowledge of the truth we have just been considering.